This is MOOCs and the impact of massive open online courses on the future of pedagogy. A panel from the 41st Annual Conference of the National Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining in Higher Education and the Professions at Hunter College. Held at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City, April 6 to 8, 2014. With moderator David Bergeron, Vice President of Post-Secondary Education at the Center for American Progress, Jeffrey R. Young, Technology Editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education and Fellow at the Berkman Center for the Internet and Society, Shanna Smith-Jaggers, Assistant Director, Community College Research Center at Columbia University, and Nicholas Anastasopoulos, Attorney with Merrick O'Connell in Worcester, Massachusetts. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning. I'm David Hershon. I'm currently the Vice President for Post-Secondary Education Policy at the Center for American Progress. For those of you who don't know, the Center for American Progress is a um, think tank in Washington, D.C. It's been around for just a decade, um, and uh, it's been an interesting transition for me from the Department of Education, where I spent uh, 34 years. Uh, it was interesting as I made this transition because uh, I went from an organization where when I left it, the average age went up, and when I joined the Center for American Progress, the average age went up. Uh, the average age of the Department of Education's Office of Post-Secondary Education, which I headed, um, was about 62 when I left. Um, and the average age of the Center for American Progress is something like 28. So um, I went through this very great culture shock as I moved from um, the Department of Education and in, in in being its chief higher education regulator uh, to, to go into the world of think tanks. And um, I'm still, after a year, adjusting to this culture shock. Um, uh, because one of the things that I realized very soon after I arrived at the center was that um, the students that, that were our interns, and we have lots of them, uh, were not at all like the, the, the people that we had in our brains as being students in higher education. With one exception, that is that I'm also a dad um, of a 22-year-old, soon-to-be college graduate. Um, and yes, after four years. Um, uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> she went to Tulane. She had enough AP credits. She should have finished in three years. So really, she taking more, taking longer than she should have. But um, her mom and dad have been happy to pay the bills, I guess. Sure. Uh, I, can't, I say I guess. Um, uh, she's been a very fortunate young woman. Um, and she finally, I think, has begun to realize it. I'm really uh, happy to be here today to talk about an issue that, that you know, has been simmering in policy circles in higher education, and that's MOOCs. And, and, so, and I'm also delighted to be uh, joined by a great panel. Um, I know uh, Jeff Young is with uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, and, and uh, for those of you who, who read the Chronicle and, and look for information about what's going on in terms of technology, you all recognize uh, Jeff's name, if not Jeff's face. Um, that's a great thing about uh, the, the world today is we all know names of people and, and we rarely have an opportunity to be in the same room with them. And when we are, it's never the city that we, we live in. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled Jeff's here. He's also uh, on a, a sabbatical, spending some time away from the Chronicle. Um, and at the, uh, I know I have to look at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Um, and, and so I'm really thrilled to, to have Jeff on the panel as I am uh, to have uh, uh, Shanna smith Jaggers. Uh, Shanna is the Associate Assistant Director of the um, Community College Research Center at Columbia, uh, another organization that, that you know, I always follow and, and enjoy reading what they're up to. And so we're really thrilled that um, Shanna is part of the panel on um, bringing the perspective of the community colleges and the impact of, of moves on community colleges to this, to this conversation. Finally, someone who I did not know in advance of this uh, this conversation being uh, planned, 
Um, uh, Nick, uh, Anastolopoulos. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Nick is uh, a, a lawyer uh, with uh, Merrick O'Connell in Western Massachusetts, and um, he brings a, a real unique perspective, and we were talking before this uh, session about the fact that you know, MOOCs and, uh, and, and other ed educational innovations uh, that we've all been thinking about and writing about really um, have the potential of either um, reinforcing existing inequities in our educational system or eliminating them. And, and it's really a, a significant uh, policy choice uh, as to how we're going to, to apply um, you know, technology, apply different modes of um, to pedagogy um, to really either to reinforce or to, uh, to um, or eliminate the, the inequities that, that do exist. And so um, he's written some on this topic, and, and so he was, it was great to have him um, join the panel. We did um, have one person who's, who, Lisa uh, uh, Payne Ozian, uh, who was with Des Moines Community, uh, Community College, um, had a family emergency and, and, and is unable to join us. Uh, but I, I don't think that diminishes the, the panel much, except we have to be concerned about her and her family as they deal with um, whatever the crisis is uh, at home. But, um, uh, and, and we all have been in that position, so uh, we, our thoughts are for, with her. Um, so we thought this morning we would uh, start with uh, Jeff uh, talking about um, his work and, and his thinking today about the role of MOOCs uh, particularly as it relates to the, to the faculty role. Um, it, I know that uh, Jeff has written on this issue, and you find his article, uh, articles on, in, in the Chronicle. Um, and so uh, we thought it would be a good place to start with, with uh, Jeff, and, and then we will um, uh, go from there. And, and so he's going to share his thoughts at the moment, and then we'll um, uh, continue with the conversation. Jeff. Cool. Um, and I don't know. Should I stand or sit? I Do whatever stand. you would like. I, I, I don't know if it's uh, it's sort of. I'll, I'll try standing if it feels too weird. I'll, I'll sit down again, or if you guys think I should sit and sit. But um, so yeah, I'm I'm on leave from the Chronicle, but I'll be back in June. So I've been on sabbatical, but while I've been there at the Neiman Foundation, I've been looking at MOOCs and kind of thinking, trying to um, kind of think more about where this is all going. And so I thought I'd just start today by. Um, First of all, just kind of hitting the Wayback Machine. Um, back to 1998, I, just some of you guys will, will remember, um, there was an earlier boom for online education, and, and there was talk of, there were big name universities um, starting spin-off for-profit companies to sell online education, and there was a big, there was a lot of concern about online education. And at that time, um, this professor named Langdon Winner at Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute um, staged a, a something that he was sort of a, a, a what he called kind of performance art to kind of critique this move to kind of what he saw as a dangerous commodification of education. So he um, made up a fake company called EduSham and he announced the automatic professor, automated professor machine like an ATM. And you would go, um, this was in 98, so um, it was, you know, back in the age of CD-ROMs, there was no such thing as Wikipedia, it didn't exist yet, um, YouTube hadn't been um, invented yet. Uh, so the internet was very different than it is now. And um, the idea was this thing would spit out a, a CD, you would put in some money and it would spit out a CD-ROM, you would learn, and it would spit out a degree. And it was a joke, um, meant to sort of show that online education was a bad idea in his mind. But now we're back, and um, you know, in the last uh, couple years, we've seen this rise of um, MOOCs, the massive open online courses, which I'm sure people in this room already know. I don't have to do too much of what it is, but um, I will say, I wonder. I'm curious, how many of you guys have, tr have tried a MOOC at all, like to, to log on to one and, and poke around a little bit? Um, so some people, um, you know, the the basic pitch when they came out was this, unlike this earlier revolution, or sorry, this earlier buzz wave of like online education back in 98 and around that, and that sort of dot-com boom, this round started with this idea of giving away. So there's no money this time, there's no charge as the idea for the first MOOCs, and you have this notion, the, the founders of 
uh, the first big MOOC providers uh, a couple years ago were talking about comparing education to a basic human right, that, that this could bring education to all. And so um, the basic idea, for those of you who haven't peaked at one, I mean, the, you know, the, the shorter lectures, videos, so they're not just sitting a camera in the back of a classroom and saying good luck, as some early kind of early access projects have put some lectures online. And this was also, um, you know, the idea is you would do homework if you're a student in these free massive courses, um, and it would be graded because, you know, by a computer, or software rather, or by peers who might create a, an English paper. Um, like if you turned in a paper, three other strangers on the internet might grade yours, and you grade three others, and it might all work out. And then, obviously, this only works if you have a lot of students. And so the average MOOC enrollment still, by a recent study, showed the average enrollment is 40,000 people. Everyone, of course, should question the number of 40,000. It just means people click the simple, yes, I'm interested button. But when you still think about, um, so you have a far lower number that actually does any poking around in any meaningful way at the content, but you're still talking about averages in the thousands, uh, low thousands for classes um, out on the, the free and open web. So you're still a bigger group than we're used to in a typical college classroom. Um, and so I just wanted to say, so what's different? I get a lot of questions, and people ask a lot of good questions about like, so you know, online education has been around a while, in fact, it's it's you know it's something that's that non the non Harvards of the world had been doing for over ten years online, um, and we'd had these other waves of hype that didn't work out. So what's different? So I think the it's important to kind of think about the Google search. I think um, in my mind to see what the people uh, promoting this round think think is different. So we've all done this, right? You're typing a Google search or Bing, same thing, and it's there are five kind of amazing things that are happening here that I think are worth noting. And some of them are only recent that it's possible technologically. And one of them is like if I was nervous about speaking, I might type in public speaking. The first amazing thing is that it knows Google or search engines know English, right? They know how to parse language. And so then they could do the next amazing thing, which is to guess what I was going to type, which it usually does pretty well. The third thing that's pretty amazing is it, it knows everything possible that I might be looking for. It knows what's out there on the internet. Google has this amazing index of, of the web. And also, uh, or big index, right? It knows all the stuff. And then it also knows um, you know, what other, every other user of Google has clicked on when he started a search like this. So it has this, this big data of, of knowledge. And the kind of very newest part of it is that it knows, you know, I'm living in Boston area right now. It knows that because I'm logged in or, or it's grabbing my IP or something. And so it's able to know something personal about me and connect the personal detail about me with this big, big data project that is the current web and the sort of artificial intelligence going on there is actually relatively new and I think remarkable. And so, better for worse, and so it's no accident that all the big MOOC providers that started this whole um, wave of publicity were all computer scientists and artificial intelligence people in particular. And so you have Coursera coming out of Stanford's artificial intelligence lab, both of these people were in AI. Um, this is Anand Agarwal, the founder of, of um, edX, which is Harvard and MIT started, and now it's got partners elsewhere. Um, he is from their computer science artificial intelligence lab, and Udacity is another Stanford professor. Actually, this, uh, these two people both worked at Google. Um, or, uh, so you have this very, very, um, the vision then is that it's not just that um, you put education videos online, because yes, that's been around forever. But their notion, I think, entering is one of the first big courses. He had 100, you know, over 100,000 enrollments in this artificial intelligence machine learning class. <coughs> and what he, his intuition or his bet was that he could do the same thing for education that the that Google dropdown was doing, which is that if a student is doing exercises in an online system, then the system could kind of watch over their shoulder or when they turn it in, analyze it, and do something equivalent of like. I noticed you got the wrong answer, but in a way that a lot of other people have gotten it wrong, here's some help automatically. And so this is the same thing as filling in public speaking and connecting it to some other resource. And so for specifically for that MOOC, he had this error message that he created when somebody got it wrong in the same way. He said like it would get an auto message saying, you got it wrong, but look at this part of your step and you might get it, that might be where you need to look. So this automatic intervention is the is the idea. So that's their, their premise, um, is that if, if this kind of moment of the web is that there's this big data meets 
individual person. And so the computer kind of knows the crowd and it knows you. Then education might actually be a kind of killer app for these people looking for cool ideas to point their technology at. So that's, I think, where MOOCs came from, why they're different, just kind of broadly, conceptually. And then you have people like um, the head, uh, the president of uh, California, I'm sorry, um, San, Jose. San Jose State University, excuse me, Mohammed Kiyomi, who, and other people, started to say, well, actually, giving education free to the world is great, but what if we could use these MOOCs to cut down costs um, by offering a low-cost option where we have, um, and so they started doing things like an experiment where you take, students might take a MOOC and then for a very discounted rate get credit, um, or have a flipped classroom, which I'm sure people have heard of this idea, where you maybe have the lecture videos that were made for those MOOCs, or some of those exercises that are self-grading, be used for an in-class um, in class setting where, and back to the topic of today, is the role of the professor might be a little different. That instead of being in front of the room like I am right now, the professor might be in a role of coaching or leading people through, going through these exercises or going through other exercises while they watch, and the, the kind of um, interactive textbook is done with the, the web videos and with the auto grading idea. And so, okay, so but where are we now? So this was all the kind of leading up to more recently, and in, in last year, the San Jose State University's philosophy department put out this open letter that a lot of people probably saw, where they kind of objected um, conceptually to this notion of, especially the idea of bringing these MOOCs and this platform into the college setting, and, and worried about replacing faculty with technology. Um, and, and also things like standardizing overly material, like they pointed to a uh, a course offered by Michael Sandel from Harvard University on um, philosophy and ethics and pointed out that that's exactly the kind of thing where if you had, if people gathered around one eth ethics course as a model, then we would have a lack of diversity, that all kinds of um, negatives could be <coughs> pedagogy and teaching, um, and, and it was a threat in their view to the, to the system uh, as it should be. So that all just sets the stage for like where we are now, I think, compared to those first, very first days of, of this idea. Um, obviously, the people taking MOOCs, by and large, have not been um, the ones who actually click and, and go through the material in any in earnest. Are not the kind of people that are replacing a, a college experience with an online experience. Um, it hasn't turned out to be this silver bullet where. Um, at least so far, where people are doing it as a replacement. And there are a lot of good reasons for that, but this MIT data is just one example, which is pretty typical from the MOOCs we've seen, where they're not only not, uh, you know, they're not undereducated, they're overeducated, they're very well educated. And so you have the 64% the of the people that are enrolled in these MOOCs, in this particular um, set of MOOCs at MIT, were uh, not only, only had, they, they already had a bachelor's degree. And many of them, as you'll see, already had a master's degree or, or even had a doctoral's degree, a doctoral degree under their belt. And they're taking these courses for other, for other reasons besides, you know, getting an undergraduate education. So anyway, so this is going to, by now you guys all knew this before I even started, that it's not going to replace residential experience. And I think there's even less talk of that, although of course we can talk a little bit about whether it could push three-year degree ideas and, and there are other things around that people are talking about. But I think it's important to think about so what does it mean, though? I don't think MOOCs are unimportant or uninteresting. I think there's still possibilities that they may be disruptive. For one thing, as a journalist, we always follow the money, and the number, the amount, the dollar investments in these MOOCs are still very large um, by the hundreds of institutions that are that are dabbling in them right now, um, and some of them that have taken very big bets, like Harvard and MIT. Um, not to mention the companies, this private sector investment by the Silicon Valley. Um, so I think that the three things I just wanted to very quickly lay out, uh, not to talk too much, but one of them is, okay, so what it, when we look at what people are doing with them, yeah, they're a lot like an interactive textbook, like I said, um, but I talked to Luke Bloomfield, who is in this picture here in the top. He's a, a physics professor at um, the University of Virginia. He's been teaching a course on physics there called How Things Work. He's very popular. Uh, it's, a, it's meant for, you know, whoops, it's meant for people who aren't, um, I can't go back now, excuse me, um, who aren't majors, I'll get to that in a second. Oh, I'll use these instead. 
pardon me, technology. Um, <laughs> so it's meant for people who aren't majors. Um, so it's trying to introduce people to physics who aren't necessarily going to do it. And then he also wrote a textbook, How Things Work, um, that it sells elsewhere. And he was an advisor to a popular Discovery <coughs> Channel show, or I don't know how popular it is, but Discovery Channel show. He was not only an advisor, but he was a co-host briefly for Some Assembly Required, where he was trying to explain physics to a broad audience. So this is public intellectualism, right? This is what professors do um, sometimes. So he was, when I talked with him, he was trying to compare what the different formats are like. And he felt like the TV side was very, like they were, as he said, the producers were allergic to science. They were, he was always fighting to get any meaningful science in his view into the TV show. So that was frustrating to him. And, and the textbook, it just didn't have a broad, a super wide audience, even though it did fine, because it's a textbook. And so how do you, his, his excitement in doing a MOOC, which he did for Coursera on how things work, was to try to do a kind of a media that might be a little more popular interest, something, you know, video and, and exercises, and, but that he had the director's cut on what was in there, trying to make it a little more uh, rigorous. And I took this course, and um, how do you say I passed it, but the, um, this MOOC, and, you know, it is different than a TV show. There's not, I mean, it is definitely more rigorous. There's definitely a lot more vocabulary felt. It definitely, you're, you're diving into things. It's, it's the, the, lec the, the tests are actually pretty hard. And there's this kind of sense of, of doing something different. And so it's this new form of public intellectualism. And so I jumped ahead accidentally, but in a way I think I'm already hearing some anecdotal evidence that people are using it, using these MOOCs as kind of a Rosetta Stone, if you will, for academic disciplines. So there's this encouragement to like work across disciplines in your research, right, or be interdisciplinary. But often if you're going to work with somebody across a discipline, you don't know their discipline. Um, and you find it may feel bad about that. Or, so these MOOCs are maybe a great way for people, I'm hearing people kind of tapping into them before they go to the genetics conference or whatever, if they're going to work with somebody in that area. Maybe they're social scientists and they're working with some geneticists over some kind of cultural thing, but they don't want to know the field better, so they use they kind of use this. That's why some of these PhD students taking MOOCs anecdotally are seeing this. So it's, it is interesting that, that that's happening. Um, and if you look at, there's kind of a vocabulary, a lot of the... MOOCs that are offered are very introductory course stuff, like gen ed stuff. And so you can see, there are a lot of them are this, like, how to think like a data scientist, immunologist, probability, how to think like somebody who does, you know, jazz. So there's this kind of, I kind of joke that, you know, like hips, the, the different kind of, the app, photo apps that let you do different lenses that you can just slide over. There's this almost like fantasy that you can just kind of look into through different professions' eyes which I think is interesting. So it's this kind of interdisciplinary hacking, hacking. And so I've looked at comments. You just go into these MOOCs, there are discussion threads where people are just introducing themselves, saying why they take the course. Don't worry too much about all these, sorry, there's a lot of words on this slide, but basically people saying things like, I see so many different people that aren't geneticists in this course. Um, I'm, you know, but this is great that people are hacking outside their discipline in the field. So this is the kind of, I don't know, um, I'm very curious what this audience thinks. I think there's uh, this great book from the 70s that Burton Bledstein wrote on, the, on the, raw, the culture of professionalism and how he tracks how um, these different professions, whether it be major league sports or um, you know, people who run funeral homes, who used to be the funeral home director but now are mortuary scientists, that, and, and in academic disciplines, a, an increasing professionalization and it's kind of you know, specialization that happened um, that he traces the history of. And it especially happened in higher ed, in his, as he notes in his book. But I recently interviewed him for a different story, and I think what you're seeing potentially in these MOOCs, and I think he uh, pretty much was agreeing that there's a there's a move away from that, and it's this move back to kind of a feeling of trying to cross those boundaries again after a hyper specialization. And I feel like the MOOC, by having all these MOOCs out there, even if people are the, having them out there, kind of sends a signal that anybody can learn how to do these things, and that. They're just free and out there if you take the time. And I think that's a different message than was sent in the past. So um, two more things, and I'll try to be less, uh, I'll try to be quick about them. One is, uh, two is that MOOCs are also this, they're kind of a different thing. This picture, if you're wondering what it is, is the, um, this is the Android app for Coursera. So Coursera is one of those MOOC providers I mentioned in the beginning, um, and this, they have an iPhone app already, but this is what it looks like. You can take their courses on, on a phone now. And so there's this interesting way in which, again, back to the way the users are actually using them, they're sort of presenting it as this kind of 
diversion error, diversion thing. Now, I think they're more and more moving toward acknowledging that you're not replacing the undergraduate college experience. It's this kind of idea of just learning for fun or learning extra material to you know enrich yourself. And I think that that is is kind of the way in which some of the MOOC momentum is going. And then the question is, well, all these colleges that are investing in them, what is their role in that? Is that is that an ex is it part of the extension school kind of mission that colleges have? What are the professors' uh, appropriate role? Is this a public intellectualism that more professors will participate in? What does that mean for the professor's role? Um, and it's certainly not only colleges that are in that part of what MOOCs are doing. If you look at what edX has done some partnerships in the last few months, they have now offered partnerships with places like the Smithsonian World Economic Forum, which of course has the big um, Davos summit every, every January. And so the IMF, Linux Foundation, so Linux, you can take a MOOC on how to do Linux from the Linux Foundation. And so if you roll this forward, you can imagine, bless you, you can imagine all these uh, you know, different entities offering courses on the online. And of course some of that's done already is continuing education. But it's, it's kind of this trying to make continuing education, I feel like there's been this lifelong learning buzz and continuing education buzz for a long time, but it hasn't really gotten much kind of respect, so to speak, or it, it, there has been at least some, I feel like there hasn't, it hasn't been this kind of, um, it's been kind of looked at differently than, than higher, higher ed and separately and, and maybe lesser. <coughs> but there's this move by all these players to try to make it cool and put it in the apps and have all this kind of energy behind it. And that's interesting and I wonder how much it will take off or not or whether it should. And what, again, what professors' role in that space is. So um, now the, the thing that edX is working on that hasn't fully launched yet, but I think is very, very interesting to note, is that they're offering this, their, their platform, right, which is the core of what their whole vision is, is this idea that you could have this amazing AI platform where you could do the automated exercises. They're going to offer that so that anybody can teach a class on their system, um, if, whether you're a professor or not. And so um, when that opens, it'll be very interesting to see what that means when anyone can offer a class on anything. Um, you know, we've seen Wikipedia go through a cycle of people dismissing it and laughing it off, and now people seeing it as uh, more robust, although there's still questions about Wikipedia's quality. So um, here comes this idea of Professor Everybody, for better or for worse. There's already one example of what, to look into what that might look like, there's this company called <coughs> Unity. Now these are not, these, these are sort of MOOCs, but they're not as advanced, so to speak. They're not really as technologically savvy as the ones that, that the, the MOOC, that org is trying. But, they, but they, have, they let people set up, anyone teach a course and set a price on it. So it's almost like a, a marketplace where, just like you go on Amazon, you can put your book on Amazon, and they'll take 30% and you get the rest. This is the same deal, they'll take 30% and you get the rest of the money when something, when you charge $250 for how to make an iPhone app. Or there are some academic, more academic topics on this as well. A lot of the academics working on this space have done it for free. They're not charging in many cases. But this woman, Bess Ho, as I picked out as one example, she made over $200,000 in a year, apparently, teaching um, these types of courses in iPhone apps. And when I did talk to her, though, it's, the, the picture gets complicated really quickly. And that this was the first year she did it. She's not able to repeat that, at least when I last talked to her, partly because that was, she was one of the only ones teaching at a certain moment. Now there are over a thousand courses, I think, on this platform. Very many, as you might guess, a lot of people are doing iPhone, how to build an iPhone app or some version of that. And so now she's crowded out in this space and it's difficult to get attention. She doesn't have a marketing budget. So like, she's not making that again. And so you know, she's also, I think, teaching at a, a, a local area college uh, as an adjunct as well. And so you know, she's, she's not necessarily finding this a secure way to live as a professor's life. So it's not the dream job that it was touted the first year, at least for her. And I think it does. So then, it's, the MOOC space is also getting crowded now. There's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of intro physics classes already, um, not just the Blue Bloomfields. So I, I sort of joke that the disruption. One of the disruptions is that the technology makes it so that anyone can offer. It's almost like the way food trucks are to restaurants. Like the the cost of starting this business. The food truck is obviously a lot cheaper to get in the game than a, starting a standalone restaurant. And so you have the you know, generic college seal on your food truck, and you can do that. Um, and it's almost to this MOOC that we're starting to be like the lemonade stand of learning, where the professor's got their little booth, and their, their, their knowledge is for sale, or their teaching is for sale. And I wonder, the, you know, I'm being a little facetious, but, it's, but the point is, like, this is the kind of 
change that we're that we're seeing, and what is but but Lemonade Stand hasn't made us stop buying lemonade from restaurants sometimes, and it um, they haven't gone the restaurants haven't gone away, and everyone of course says no one's going to care about a Lemonade Stand credential, and that is a good question. I think that's the, the whatever the million dollar billion dollar question is whether anyone will care whether you've gotten taken that MOOC by that very good professor from UVA, how things work, which there's, there's, this is my LinkedIn page, so I got to embed that in my LinkedIn page, and this is the way these, these MOOC providers are doing right now, and of course LinkedIn already has other ways to like informally signal skills, some of them, I don't know if you guys ever use LinkedIn, but you know, there's this other weird thing, <laughs> it's, it's sort of strange, where your friends can just vouch that you know things? <laughs> and I didn't even ask it. So I know AP style according to four of my friends. <laughs> thanks, thanks guys. And I'm a, I don't know if I'm a good editor or not. Five people say I can edit. You know, I, I, um, my job is, I, my job title is the Chronicles is senior editor. So I should be editing the edit. But this is like, so will anyone care, care about these credentials? There's already this kind of, there are experiments in these, and if, uh, LinkedIn of course, uh, who knows if this will all catch on, but storytelling. Thanks. <laughs> you can imagine, you can imagine that maybe right. there's a way in which this is enough for certain things. Maybe, maybe there's a way in which that MOOC or other kind of light credentials might be enough in this world where maybe my main job, I have the credential from a traditional college, but I've been working a lot on the side on some side project, and for that, my lightweight credentials might be enough for that, for that side project. And so that's the question is whether people will care. And the third piece that I'll be really quick on is, is so in a way, I think what you're seeing is the teaching role, a lot of talk about the teaching role of being unbundled. And when, you know, when we talk about the flipped classroom even, the, the idea is like, if you're kind of breaking it apart and thinking about, you know, teachers do a lot of things. Um, this, I always feel bad telling the audience of people in higher ed how teachers work, but like, you guys know all this, right? But, but just remember that, remember that as you teach, you're doing a lot of things. You are sometimes delivering content information, sometimes you're drawing out people in discussions. Sometimes you are, um, you know, kind of checking the work they've done to see if it's right. So there are all these, and there are many other things when you're really mentoring, you're thinking about all these things that you end up doing in the traditional teaching role. That is, I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of companies in Silicon Valley coming in and saying, oh, I can start a little business that'll do that, a little piece of that. And so you see things like, oh, so I had this, up, you know, there was the CEO of, of Google, since that's my obsession at the start of this day, is Eric Schmidt, and he spoke recently at Tufts University. Um, so I, I stood up and asked him a question, just like a lot of people, my question, of course, was about MOOCs. And I was asking him, what is this, uh, how important is it to Google? Because Google is a partner in MOOC.org on building that technology. And again, like a lot of other people helped start these early MOOC experiments. And you know, he was, he was trying not to make any news. I mean, he's a CEO of a company, so he wasn't like saying anything exciting too much. But I found it interesting that he did say, we really want to democratize access to education and the access to teaching and then let the marketplace figure it out. And he also mentioned, you know, we'll, there's another quote where he basically was saying, you know, we'll, we'll put, when MOOC.org is up, we'll see who the best teachers are. Like, it'll just be the audience on the side. And there's this interesting point about how, you know, I think for a higher education mindset, that's kind of a radical and uncomfortable idea of letting the market decide what good teaching is. Hmm. And there, so the, the, the sort of piecework of teaching, getting back to that, there's this thing that's, this service that Google launched in November, not directly about higher ed at all. They probably don't see it as about education necessarily, but it is education. It's, it's this kind of casual learning that I was mentioning earlier, this kind of continuing ed 2.0. It's called Help Outs, and they use their, I think it's to stir up some use of their Hangout technology where you can do these video chats one on one. Um, and so what they do is this service, again, a marketplace where anybody can go and offer a one-on-one -on -one chat session on the internet, a video chat. So you can go on there and put up your math tutoring or German skills. You can tutor somebody over this system. You can either make it free, as this person's done, or you can charge 50 cents a minute, or you can charge anything. One guy I talked to is charging $300 an hour to advise startups. So there's all kinds of different people on this help out space. But I think what, what it is, is it's kind of saying like, you know, well, there's one guy on here that is a great books, he's teaching a great books help out. For 15 minutes, he will talk with you and help you pick good books to read. So he's doing this kind of, is that, and he's, a, he's actually at a university teaching a great books class. Um, so, so this is an interesting 
again, public intellectual role that this, this professor is taking. But if you look at what this company is doing, it's piecing out, here's one aspect of teaching, a kind of one-on-one -on -one thing, and maybe you only need 10 minutes of it, and maybe then you'll go back to your MOOC, and maybe you'll be able to get out of a rut there. And you'll see, you see already like sites that are telling you which MOOCs are better than others, like a Yelp for MOOCs. You have some sites that tell you there are like discussions around MOOCs, but that are separate. So you have these different aspects of teaching being different solutions being offered by companies. And that is, I think, again, worth noting and sort of interesting for the role. And then the last thing I'll say before handing the, this over, and I look forward to your questions and the discussion on the panel overall, is that what I kind of see more and more is that even though MOOCs, at the beginning of this presentation, were talked as a way to save money for college teaching. It seems like, at least for, for, for the selective colleges, it may have the, the effect of driving up the cost of offering teaching. Because if you look at the kind of experiments that places like Harvard, where I'm a fellow this year, but also places um, are, that are doing these MOOCs or even experimenting in the lightest way, making a, making a sort of lamest MOOC possible still costs you around $50,000, and that's not accounting for the professor's time. So these are investing, even at the colleges, just doing a tiny little foot in the water, toe in the water, they're spending money. And also, if you start to think about, can you really imagine in a selective college that costs so much, telling students, oh, just, just watch the MOOC videos and you'll never have a professor? It's kind of hard to imagine. And so when you look at my colleague from the Chronicle, Jeff Salingo, his book, um, College Unbound, which I really recommend, he talks about all the ways colleges have gotten in an arms race for spending on things like climbing walls and student centers and all this stuff. In a way, though, they haven't had to do that, or they haven't done that as much with teaching, except for smart classrooms that are on the tour, right, which have all the fancy technology. But, but even that, it's like pretty cheap to build a building compared to, or to build a, to add to an existing building with some technology, rather than add to staffing or helping to teach in new ways. So if you're going to train and use te do teaching in radically new ways, with the MOOC, the, basically the flipped classroom question is, if the professor is now this uh, different role in the classroom, everyone I talk to about these, when I talk to professors about the flipped classroom, they're like, that's a nice idea. Like, I like to, to work students one-on-one -on -one or in groups. But if I've been used to lecturing, and now they're going to watch the lecture videos and come to the classroom, what do we do in the classroom? And so there's, that's like not going to be like free time. You have to make up, you have to schedule that time, plan that time. That's labor, that's time. And that gets back to money. So it's hard for me to see how it's a cost saver, at least in the at least in the elites, and then the question of haves and have-nots it, as it plays out broadly is, is a bigger question. So that's, that's my thoughts as I like looking at the MOOC space um, from the moment and what it could mean for professors. Thank you guys for listening, and I'll turn it over for now. Well, well Shanna uh, gets her PowerPoint loaded. Uh, when, when we were planning this session, I was really, uh, you know, the, this question of um, you know, for everybody else and, and the role of community colleges. I spent the last two days in Indianapolis talking about adult learners, and so I was thrilled that, that Shannon was on this panel because now she can answer all my questions for the last two days. All right, great. Uh, well, so uh, as you said earlier, I'm from the Community College Research Center, which is housed at Teachers College at Columbia University. Um, and we do research on uh, the almost 8 million students who currently attend community colleges. That represents about half of all the undergraduates uh, in the United States. And the kinds of students that attend community colleges are also largely the same kinds of students who attend uh, regional public universities. So um, some of the issues that are really relevant to community colleges are also relevant to you if you, if you work at um, a, uh, a, a less selective um, a regional university. So, you know, MOOCs are just sort of the, the, the latest instance in a, in a long tradition of distance education. And community colleges have always been really interested in distance education uh, because they want to serve all members of their community, even if some of those members are difficult to reach or if they're people that other institutions might not necessarily consider to be college material. Um, so community colleges were, were, were very interested in MOOCs when they first came on to the scene. Um, because they're free, um, they're open to anyone with an internet connection. And the idea is that they could theori theoretically allow anyone, anywhere, anytime, to access not just a college education, but an elite level of college education, a Harvard or Stanford level of college education. Um, so the idea is that this would democratize higher education, because it would allow 
low-income students or other traditionally underserved populations to access something that would just simply not have been possible for them to access before. Um, so in my, in, in my talk, I, I, I'm really going to sort of look at this issue of democratization and the extent to which we can feel that MOOCs and online learning in general may be serving as a democratizing force or not. Um, so first I'm going to talk about who takes uh, online courses, just regular fully online courses right now in community and technical colleges, um, who takes MOOCs, which is a point uh, that, that, that was touched on earlier, and then how well students do when they take these courses. Um, and then I'll discuss how community colleges are reacting to these trends. So first is the question of who takes advantage of fully online courses. So um, we did an analysis of student transcripts data across uh, 57 colleges in two states. It was hundreds of thousands of students who were enrolled across a span of several years. Um, and, and looked at the students who took at least one online course compared to students who chose an entirely face-to-face -face curriculum during that time. And we found big differences between those two groups of students. So as you might expect, those who choose online courses are likely to be older, over 25. They're more likely to have dependents. They're more likely to work full time. So online uh, education provides some flexibility to them to be able to, to, when we talk to interview students who are in this situation, a lot of them will tell us, well, I like to take one or two online courses a semester mixed in with the rest of my face-to-face -face courses because that gives me the flexibility to take a full time schedule which otherwise I wouldn't be able to do. I wouldn't be able to go to my kids' soccer matches. I wouldn't be able to attend important meetings if it had to be at these face-to-face -face classes all the time. Um, but, so, online education uh, may very well improve access for this group of students. On the other hand, students who choose at least one online course are also less likely to be ethnic minorities. They're less likely to be low income, and they're less likely to be academically underprepared when they start college. So online education is, is really selecting for more of the privileged uh, student than it is for the traditionally underserved student. So it's not clear that online education is, is necessarily improving access for these traditionally underserved populations. So we don't have a lot of studies yet of MOOC demographics. Um, uh, we, we mentioned one earlier. Here's another sort of similar uh, set of uh, data from uh, Penn State College. Um, so uh, the, the numbers that were cited earlier, um, which were for Harvard, I think, for Harvard's edX uh, courses, uh, hold on all the students that were taking the course from around the world. Uh, and I think it was like 67% or something like that had a bachelor's degree. When you narrow it and look at students who were taking the courses from the United States, the proportion of bachelor's degrees tends to go up. Um, so here uh, in this Penn State, they found that uh, the proportion that had uh, college degrees uh, from the United States were over 85%, um, compared to just about 30% of the U.S. population at large. So the students who are taking moves are quite different from the regular um, United States population. Um, and then this observation is reinforced when you look at why students enroll in courses. Um, most of them were enrolling for curiosity or just for fun. Um, another big chunk, we're doing it for what we might call uh, continuing education reasons to up upgrade job skills. Only about 7% were representing what we might think of as the, the traditional type of student, somebody who needs to break into higher education and get a decent job in the first place. Um, so now, why wouldn't underserved populations be taking more advantage of these opportunities that were available to them? Well, one reason is that we still have um, a digital divide in this country. So according to the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, the vast majority of white and Asian households in this country have high-speed internet access, uh, but only just above half of Hispanic and African-American households do. And if we're concerned about providing high-quality education to students who live too far away from a college campus to be able to take advantage of it, then online education doesn't necessarily help these groups either because only 58% of rural households have access to high-speed internet. And if you've ever tried to take an online course without high-speed internet, that, that it's just not a good idea. It's not something that anybody wants to do. Um, another key reason why they may not be taking advantage of these courses is that a lot of students don't particularly like online learning. Um, I mentioned earlier that most online community college students actually take a mix of online and face-to-face -face courses. Very, very few take all their courses uh, online. And a recent survey from Public Agenda found that um, 
many online community college students still feel like that one or two courses online a semester is, is more than they want to be taking on the, uh, online. Um, about 41% of them wished that they could take fewer classes online, and compared to only 20% who wanted to take more online. A lot of community college students feel like they're forced into taking an online course because all the face-to-face -face courses that they want are already full. Um, and another reason why they might not want to take any more online courses than they have to is because they feel like they don't learn as much in online courses as they do in face-to-face -face courses. So in that same public agenda survey, 42% uh, of students think that they learn less online than they do face-to-face -face, compared to only 3% who think that they learn more online than they do face-to-face. Um, and these numbers are reinforced by uh, our interviews when we've gone out and talked to online students about why they take courses online, what they like about them and don't like about them. So here's some representative quotes. Um, in general, students told us that they felt like they had to teach themselves online because the instructor wasn't really there for them in the same way as they felt like they were accessible to them in a face-to-face -face course. So students said that because of that, they would only take an online course if it was a subject area that they felt relatively comfortable in, that they felt like, I'm probably going to do pretty well in this course because I, I feel like I can teach myself this content. Um, if it was a subject area that they knew was going to be difficult for them, and math came up a lot as for students as the example of a course that they wouldn't take online, um, then they wanted to take that course face-to-face. Uh, -face. And courses that they thought were important or particularly interesting uh, they also wanted to take face-to-face. -face. So, for example, the second student um, started to take a class online, and she said, well, I started to, I actually, I actually enjoyed the class, so I didn't want to just take it online. I wanted to actually go sit in the classroom and actually learn about it. So she withdrew from the online class, uh, or dropped it, and then the next semester she went and took a face-to-face -face version of it. Um, so, in our analysis of transcript data in those two states, we found that um, community college students were, were probably correct to be worried about taking difficult courses online. Um, if you look at student performance in the key gatekeeper courses in community college, which is introductory math and English, these are courses that everybody has to take in order to get their degree, um, courses that a lot of students are kind of anxious about, um, and that tend to not have terribly high success rates uh, in the first place, our analysis found that in both states, students were much more likely to withdraw from online than from face-to-face -face sections of those courses. So withdrawal means that they made it about halfway through the semester, they have already paid full tuition, they're not getting a refund, but they realize that they're not going to complete the course with the grade that they want, so they withdraw. And most of these students, they're more likely to drop out from college and never get back to these courses again than they are to come back and finish them. Um, so, the these are descriptive rates, um, but when you control for student characteristics, they remain uh, pretty consistent. Um, and also, when you just look at the students who finish the courses and compare their grades between the online and face-to-face -face sections, those who finish the online courses tend to have slightly lower grades than those who finish the face-to-face -face courses. Now, on the other hand, though, when we did we did a follow-up analysis in Washington where we looked at how this gap differs between different kinds of students. And we found that for older students, students above 25, the gap between online and face-to-face -face performance was much smaller. It was still there. They still did a little worse in online courses than they did in face-to-face -face courses. But it was a smaller gap, whereas with younger students or students who had lower prior GPAs, the gap was much larger. Um, so, how does this relate to MOOCs? Well, MOOCs don't have grades. Either you complete the course or you don't. Or sometimes there might be a, a completion with a plus if you do some extra stuff to get that, that extra level of certification. Um, so, they don't have grades, but they do have certificates of completion. And um, only a small proportion of enrollees at this point earn those certificates of completion. Um, so a Harvard-MIT study of their edX courses found that only 5% of their registrants completed the course. Now, I, was, I went and saw an Argo Wall speak the other day, and he said, yes, but a lot of students are still finishing the course. Like, 200,000 students take the course, only 5% of them finish, but that's still, you know, thousands of students. So, you know, should we be dumping on MOOCs for having these low completion rates when these students aren't, didn't pay anything, they just lost a little bit of time, um, and, you know, thousands of them actually got something out of it, which is an excellent point. However, 
we don't know who got the who who are, these five percent are. We know that um, you know in the Penn State courses, eighty-five percent of the students already had bachelor's degrees. I suspect that of these five percent, it's probably something like ninety-nine percent already have bachelor's degrees. Um, when they when they released the report, they did not um, give us that information, so we don't know. Um, so what does this all mean in terms of college access and success? Um, so first, I would say that the hype around online courses, and MOOC in particular, I think it's probably at least partially true for motivated working adults. So these are people who have already had some success in life, they have a direction for the future, they have strong time management skills, they're motivated and capable of learning on their own, and they simply can't do a face-to-face -face curriculum because of work or family demands. Um, so for these students, online education might include both access and success in getting to their goals. Um, however, the caveat there is that our interviews with um, community college students tend to indicate that um, a lot of adults fit this profile, the sort of confident, self-directed profile, for some subject areas and not others. So it may be that being able to take some you know, some portion of their coursework online might be great for them, but they might still need other portions of their coursework to be in a more face-to-face -face or hybrid setting. Um, and then, when we move to students who are more vulnerable, so these are students who are younger, who aren't really sure where they're going, who are still developing their academic skills. Um, I'm skeptical that online learning improves their access in the first place, um, and it may very well undermine their success as they try to get through college. Um, so community colleges are very aware of this, and they're concerned about it um, because they do want to improve access and flexibility for their students, but they also want them to succeed um, at the highest level that they can. Um, so how do they balance these two things? So when, in thinking about what community colleges are doing about MOOCs, in general I'd say that they are reacting with caution. Um, they certainly don't want to do anything that's going to harm any of their students. Um, and if students were to take a MOOC for a required course and perform poorly in that course, they might not come back to take any more courses. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't want to sort of go in that direction, at least uh, not right away. So, so for right now, they're experimenting with a couple of different ways of applying MOOCs. Um, the first way is um, to provide free, low-stakes, non-credit uh, preparation courses. So for example, Wake Tech uh, a college in North Carolina. Um, they created a MOOC for students who are about to take the college's placement exam or who failed the placement exam already. Um, usually if you fail the placement exam, you have to take, um, you have to pay full tuition for non-credit courses that are meant to prepare you and get you up to uh, college level math uh, so that you could take a college level course. Um, and you have to pay full tuition for that course and it doesn't count towards your degree. Um, so here, a MOOC is a low-risk alternative, because if you enroll, if you play around with it for a little while, it doesn't work for you, you haven't really lost anything except for a little bit of time. You can still go ahead and enroll in that preparatory course in the fall, just like you were going to do otherwise. Um, but if you play around with it and it does work for you, and you learn stuff, and you finish it, then that's great. You can print your certificate of completion, you can take it to the placement center, you can say, look, I finished the MOOC. They still make you take the placement test again. They're not going to rely on your completion of the MOOC to say that you're ready for college level math. But if you completed the MOOC, then hopefully you'll place higher on the placement exam and be able to go into college level math. So Wake Tech hasn't had a lot of students who've completed the MOOC and taken advantage of this option. But it also doesn't seem to be harming anybody. So I think, you know, why not? Let's just keep offering it. And students who, who want to can take it. Now the second thing that community colleges are doing um, is uh, doing pilots where they take MOOC content and flip it. Um, and most community colleges have pretty small enrollment courses. Um, they usually have caps of about um, uh, 20, 25 students uh, in their classes. And that is still the case if they are um, using a MOOC to flip the content uh, of the course. So for example, a couple of computer science uh, professors at Bunker Hill College and Mass Bay Community College in, uh, in Boston uh, adopted an MIT course on computer science, and they had students uh, 
do the content and, and the, the activities for the MOOC outside of class, and then they come into class and, and talk about it. And, and as we talked about earlier, it's a very challenging uh, situation for both the teachers and the students. It, it sort of uh, subverts or changes the expectations for both roles. Um, students aren't used to having to do that much kind of active, self-directed work outside of class, and professors aren't used to having to figure out how to, to really have um, more of a uh, an active teaching approach uh, during the class session as opposed to just a, a de delivery of content approach. Um, there's also some other challenges around that. Um, you know, uh, we talked about the uh, San Jose State example and the ethics course, and uh, one of the things that the, the, the uh, philosophy professors at San Jose State were concerned about was, you know, if, if students are taking uh, if our students, who are many of whom are low income and they've come from really challenging circumstances, if they're taking an ethics course that was designed to deal with the ethical issues and challenges of privileged rich people, instead of dealing with the ethical challenges of people like me from my background as a San Jose student, that doesn't seem like a very good match. That's probably not going to motivate and inspire and interest students in the same way as if the material is more contextualized to their own background, their, their own challenges, their own interests. And that's one of the key things that's important about having an instructor who comes from and lives in the same community as their students, who sees their students face to face, understands where they're coming from, what interests them, what motivates them, and tries to make sure that, that those things are underpinning their course. So that doesn't mean that MOOCs can't be helpful. It just means that the instructor needs to be very aware of what kind of MOOC he or she is adopting, what the content is, and how it relates to their students, and how we're going to talk about it in class and sort of connect what they're seeing there with what our experience is here. Um, so when we have flipped classrooms, I totally agree with the point that um, this is not a cost-cutting measure. We're also not expanding access because the students are still coming to class in the same way that they were before. So we're not expanding access, we're not cutting costs, um, but we might be increasing the quality of education if we do it right, and we might be improving students' success and their likelihood of graduating with a high quality credential without spending too much more money, maybe just a little bit more money. And in the end, that could save all of us, the students, the taxpayers, money in terms of the cost that it takes to graduate a student with a high quality credential. If we get more students to graduate with only a little bit more money, we're saving money in the long run for the, the product that we all care about. And so it's more important to be thinking about that, that sort of cost per high quality graduate, than it is to be thinking about how much does it cost to provide a course that a student may or may not learn anything from, may or may not finish and it may or may not sort of propel them to future success. Um, so that's uh, my overall thing. And you can go to uh, the CCRC website if you're interested in, in any of the, the, the various studies that we've done around these issues. Yeah, sure. Um, good morning. Uh, so last year I was at a conference uh, dealing with MOOCs in the context, and, and a panel was talking about the context of the university of the college engaging with the platform providers uh, on a contract basis and what the contract should contain, very boring legal uh, stuff. Uh, and one of the panelists said, uh, this year has been the decade of the MOOC, right? And so, you know, uh, I think we've heard everybody is rushing in. Uh, it's no different than any other technology. Everybody has a Twitter handle. Uh, some, some colleges, junior colleges, universities are sort of dipping it, you know, their till in. Uh, as uh, Jeff said, uh, others, I think we were talking outside, I think it's uh, Georgia Tech has an entire graduate program, uh, an engineering program, was it Jeff? Uh, computer science. Computer science program, that the entire thing is going to be done online. Uh, so the, the, the uh, rigors and the uh, admission standards are going to be there. Uh, but then after that, instead of having maybe a couple of hundred students, they're going to have thousands of students uh, internationally taking this course without ever stepping foot uh, on the campus. Um, so, uh, you know, David mentioned in, in, the, in the beginning, you know, his child is you know, going to be wrapping up soon, and as a father of two, uh, I can envision one of my boys never getting done in four years. 
uh, and this technology being wonderful because it will be entire blocks that he's sitting in a classroom looking out the window and forgetting that he's in class. So, you know, having access to this sort of platform uh, and this type of learning to support that is wonderful. I think that's something that we talked about. Um, but sort of one of the things um, that uh, uh, Department of Ed and the Office of Civil Rights um, has been thinking about and dealing with, and not to put a damper on this, uh, is how do we deal uh, with these courses when they're inaccessible to individuals, particularly with vision and hearing impairments. Um, and this isn't something new. Uh, as the technology has evolved, uh, uh, the OCR, Office of Civil Rights, through the uh, Department of Education, issued a Dear Colleague letter. A Dear Colleague letter uh, is very similar to a, a Dear John letter when you're getting dumped, and, but it's you know, a little bit different because you're about to get dumped on, you know, whenever your administrators see these Dear Colleague letters. But there was a letter in June of 2010 uh, that went to college universities, uh, college and university presidents. It was directed to their attention nationally, uh, and it warned about the use of Kindle-like devices uh, in the classroom. So it was sort of, you know, foreshadowing that there was going to be an issue here. Uh, more recently, uh, in uh, July of 2013, uh, Louisiana Tech uh, got in trouble uh, with the Justice Department because a professor uh, had part of their coursework uh, on an internet-based application. Um, and there was portions of the coursework that were online. There was a blind student. The blind student couldn't access it. The college couldn't pivot quickly enough uh, to get access to the, the student. The student had to withdraw. There's all the associated sort of issues with the withdrawal, including loss of money and the grade, and suffering the grade. Um, so uh, the university entered into an agreement, uh, and the settlement terms of that agreement uh, required, uh, over the course of five years, the university to purchase uh, and acquire and develop uh, instructional technology and materials. They needed to have annual training uh, for their instructors, TAs, and the students. Uh, the real, you know, uh, uh, what would make me shudder is that there had to be an annual reporting uh, to the DOJ, so sort of, open, you know, going down that road annually with them only, you know, sort of going to open up the possibility that there's going to be more issues. You like to stay off of the radar screen rather than be right on their radar screen. Uh, and then there was a $23,000 settlement for the student, and then her academic record was expunged. She was you know, given an opportunity to retake the course. Um, so all of this is to say that this technology uh, obviously uh, was developed after the ADA was established. So the, uh, the American with Disabilities Act was established in 1973. You know, Senator Gore wasn't in Congress until the 80s, 90s, so he couldn't have invented it uh, by then. So. Um, by way of quick background, the ADA provides that qualified individuals with a disability, so there's this issue of you know, qualified individuals sort of in the Georgia Tech, uh, whether they're qualified to get into the program or they're just taking a course, so those are two things that need to be distinguished and thought about, may not be excluded from participation in or denied the benefit of services, programs, or activities of nor subjected to discrimination by public universities and colleges. And so if you are a private in the room before you get too excited and say this doesn't apply to me, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 uh, prohibits uh, the discrimination of any college, university, or other post-secondary institution receiving federal financial aid assistance. So that's the hook in. Uh, the DOJ recognizes um, that they don't, they haven't promulgated any regulations, and so anybody looking to roll up MOOCs now, uh, that is probably going to be a year or two away. There's no suggestion that it's going to be more imminent. Um, but they have set forward standards for dealing with folks with disability, uh, particularly as it relates to communications. And sort of the test there is, is the communication, is the mode of communication, particularly with somebody that has a hearing uh, impairment or a vision impairment, as effective as? the communications given to students that don't have that. And there's a three-part test uh, that they look at in terms of how you are making this accommodation for student. And the first prong is a timely uh, delivery of the materials, the accuracy of the translation, if it's a closed caption or a braille or whatever it is, to make sure that it pairs up with the material, and then the provision in a manner and medium appropriate to the significance of the, of the message and the ability of the student. So that's usually audio recordings uh, or braille. So how is a university or college, or junior college, 
expected, what are the standards that they're expected to implement. And so DOJ directs you, uh, and the materials are in the back, they came in late, so all this is sort of spelled out. I didn't have a slide presentation, but uh, the Civil Rights Division directs folks to a web content accessibility guidelines. Um, and within those guidelines, uh, there are six things uh, for a voluntary action plan for accessibility to websites. Uh, and it's strongly recommended for now. It's one of those things, until there's something more specific, you should exercise best practices. And this is what uh, DOJ uh, uh, and, and OCR have identified as sort of better practices for now until it's more formulated. Uh, and the six things that they want colleges and universities to do is first and foremost, establish a policy, a, a statement, uh, that the website will be accessible. Uh, then the second thing is to ensure that all new and modified web pages, content, including any tags, captions, photos, <coughs> graphics, and scanned images are accessible. Uh, develop a plan for making existing content. So it's one thing when you roll out something new, but if you already have uh, materials that are online, uh, this, uh, develop a plan on how to make that accessible to the students. Uh, then the fourth thing is to ensure that there's proper training of all staff, and that includes commitments from your vendors. Uh, I did some quick research in uh, Wisconsin, Madison, uh, just entered into a contract with Coursera, uh, and the contract was broken into that the responsibility of delivering uh, the platform uh, is compliant, that's on Coursera, uh, to comply with the ADA, but that the university is responsible for ensuring the content is compliant with the ADA, so there's sort of a, a division of responsibility there. Uh, the fifth thing is when somebody goes onto a website, uh, that there is readily accessible information on how to, uh, uh, to access this if you have these impairments. Uh, and the last thing is to periodically enlist a, a group, a uh, disability group, to test the web page for ease of use from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, so those are sort of the best practices until there's something more formal that is put out. Uh, but it is something to think about. Uh, most colleges and universities are different than, you know, when I do employment law or labor law. Uh, companies are not as sensitive to these things. I think everybody in the room has dealt uh, with students that have uh, a variety of different disabilities and have different needs and accommodations uh, for them to succeed in their coursework. Uh, so I suspect that uh, most of you are sensitive to this, uh, but it is something that you, you need to be aware of. Um, and so that's it. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to, for just a few minutes about the, the broader pol public policy, um, general policy perspective. Uh, Nick has talked a little bit as it relates to students with disabilities, but I'll we'll take a step back and talk about the role of, of MOOCs in, in, uh, in general in federal policy. As most of you know, in order for um, an, an entity to be considered an institution of higher education, it, it has to basically do two things. Uh, one is it has to be recognized by a state as being a post-secondary education institution. The second, it has to be accredited by an accrediting agency that's recognized by the U.S. Secretary of Education. And so, um, it's been interesting um, to watch the development of MOOCs when I was in the department because um, these entities were not accredited. They might have been sponsored by an accredited institution, but they created a legal structure that said, sat separate and apart from their, the institution of higher education itself. And so the, the courses the MOOCs were providing were by definition outside of the scope of, of accreditation and therefore not eligible for uh, things like Title IV benefits, uh, tax benefits that accrued to uh, college students. And so we watched them with great interest. Um, but as Nick said, it was the, you know, the year that was the decade of the moves, where, where I couldn't go to a meeting on Capitol Hill, at the White House, Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, you name it, where somebody didn't talk to me about moves. It was, it was a constant conversation about how are we going to get MOOCs into the federal aid system. And I paused and said, do we really want them to be? Um, and over time, I, the, the answer that, that I came to is, well, maybe. Um, and the well, maybe 
starts with um, a, a fundamental disconnect that exists in our accrediting system. When accreditation was created, institutions were basically programs of instruction where um, the, the content and the structure of that learning was well understood and where, where the institution really measured progress towards a degree for students in, in ways that, that maybe don't happen today. Um, and they, because they were, because of, largely because of scale. And you know, when, when we, when credit agencies were in, came into existence, our institutions were counted in hundreds, not in tens of thousands. Students were counted in hundreds and not tens of thousands. So the scope of that um, has changed. And the number of institutions has exploded. We have 75, 7,600 institutions in higher education in the United States today. And so the, the, this question about what is quality has gotten really much murkier. And one of the critical things for me is that in most institutions, the delivery of education and the assessment of learning occurs at the course, which accreditors never look at. Hardly do accreditors look at programs of instruction. They look at systems within institutions to see whether they, it leads to the reasonable probability that good learning is occurring. But it's not about whether instruction is occurring well and of course whether learning is being assessed. There are some changes going on, though, in, in, in higher education. Um, I, I visited um, Sarah Lawrence, and I hate to bring, you know, really prestigious institutions into these conversations, because they are, they, they're, what they're doing is hard to take to scale. But they made a decision a couple of years ago, at the urging of their creditor, to think differently about how they assess learning. Rather than just assessing it course by course, really taking a step back and saying, what is it that we want all of our students to know and be able to do with what they know when they graduate? And how do we know if the student is progressing towards that goal? And so they, they developed a, a regime for assessing the competency. That's not their word. They use the word capabilities. Uh, they would be annoyed if I called them competency, um, because they say it's capability. Um, that they want all their students to have at the end, and what are the waypoints for assessing that. And then they leave it to their high-intensity um, counseling system, their DON system, to assess whether each student is making progress towards that goal. It's a fascinating, um, for me, a fascinating turn on this question, because it really does force the conversation about where does learning occur. And that brings us back squarely to MOOCs, because in my view, um, you know, the best of the MOOCs are delivering very high quality, yes, very standardized, and yes, very specific to the location of the institution where the, the MOOC is, exists. So um, it doesn't address the, the, the kind of diversity that exists within our higher education system and within the institutions um, that, that you are all faculty at. So, so there is this disconnect, but it is a way, it is a mechanism to bring some of the best thinking, best instruction or practice into the classroom and then use that as a launching off point for, for conversations and for learning that maybe is a little deeper than would, ex could exist without the existence of it. And so for me, it's, it's, it's MOOCs play a, could play a critical role and really, you know, improving the quality of what is happening within the classroom and providing a resource to faculty that didn't exist before. And that that's the way that fundamentally MOOCs could come into the into the conversation. The only other way, in my view, that 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 could you could see a turn into a place where MOOCs become more central to federal education policy is if instead of accrediting institutions, the, we, we create accreditors that accredit courses. And, and so um, last fall I, I wrote, co-authored a, a, a column for Inside Higher Education with 
Steve Klinsky. Steve Klinsky is uh, the founder of New Mountain Capital, uh, which is a hedge fund. Um, a hedge fund that has no education assets and their funds. <coughs> uh, and it, although they did own Strayer University for a while. So, um, and Steve really wanted to engage in a conversation about, that, that's reflected in that, uh, that, in that column, about is there a way for us to think about accreditation differently so that we're assured that what is being delivered in every course is of high quality and that, that every student who's being uh, learning in those courses is assessed against some measure of, of quality. And, and, you know, I was accused of burning the house down um, by accreditors saying, well, you can't do that. That's impossible. And so, um, and so it's been an interesting conversation since last fall. Um, I will also say, when I was with the department, I did oversee the process of recognizing creditors, so I knew a little bit about uh, the likely response from the creditors when I, I did that, uh, that column, but it does pose the question. So why would somebody like Steve be interested in moves? Well, the key question, and Steve didn't raise it with me, but pretty much everybody else that you talk to does, and it's how do you monetize moves? How do you make money off of moves? And there's no clear business model for making money off of moves. <coughs> Even after the year that was the decade of the moves, there's no clear way to figure out how one even recovers the investment in moves. Never mind makes money off of them. And so I think that, that as we think about federal policy going forward um, in the broader context, um, that's going to be the critical question because that is the question that was the result of the, the, the first real significant movement to online education. Because it was how do you take those online institutions, whether it's the University of Phoenix or others, to scale. And so that there you were able to recover your investment and, and make some money on the deal. And and we learned through painful lesson the risks in that. And in 2002, uh, four year for profit colleges had graduation rates that were 64%. And by 2008, 2009, right at the time the Obama administration was taking office, the graduate on-time graduation rate was down to about 22%. And the last time I looked, it was down to about 14 for that sector, largely impacted by the large online institutions driving down um, wage rates. I also will say that some of that has to do with paying incentive compensation to recruiters that brought in um, students who weren't qualified, weren't <coughs> necessarily even interested in wholly online programs for the reasons that uh, Shanna talked about. Um, but it does beg the, the question, about is, is MOOCs just another way to recycle this problem of creating more failure, not more success? And I'm all about uh, creating cultures of of success and not failure. Um, and, and think that federal policy ought to be driving to success not failure. And, and so um, that's kind of where my head is at the moment. Fortunately, I don't have to uh, implement policies. I don't have to regulate anymore because I now work for a think tank. Um, and, and so for me, I'm relieved of that, that direct responsibility and happy to, to have let that go. About a year ago, my life is much better. I'm less stressed. I've lost a lot of weight. My diet's better, all good things, uh, but it's, but but the, the, the this is a really uh, been an interesting and, and really stressful uh, thing for the government to try to figure out how to put loops in that kind. Uh, with that, we've got about ten minutes for questions, conversation. Um, ask you to introduce yourself and say where you're from. Hi, I'm Lance Hurd, and I'm from Mount San Antonio College in California, and the Faculty Association president. My question that I, I'd like each of you to consider uh, relates to California Senate Bill 520 because uh, the impression 
that I get from your conversation is that 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 bill could not have been implemented yet. My question to you would be, wouldn't this be a different conversation had that bill actually passed? Because my interpretation of the bill is that it, it in fact, um, was designed for uh, community colleges to give college credit to students who completed MOOCs. Uh, so yes, replacing face-to-face -face education. And also, uh, this was all from third-party providers also providing the profit incentive to monetize uh, that level of education. So what do you think of uh, Senate Bill 520? Had it been passed, how, how, would, how could it have been implemented with our current accreditation uh, system? Or, or, or what, are the, what are the major issues with that? Because Instead of it coming from the colleges, it's coming from the legislature, and had it passed, we would be doing something about it right now. Well, first thing is, is I, I think the idea or the rhetoric behind the bill was students aren't being able to get into the courses they need, so let's give them more options for getting into courses. Um, but that was on the heels of course uh, sections being slashed over the course of what, five or ten years because of cuts in funding to higher education. So it strikes me as a squirrely argument. Um, so, <laughs> uh, unless you're the lobbyist. <laughs> unless you're the, unless you're the lobbyist. Um, I, you know, I'm really not sure what would have happened if that bill had passed. I, I think that. You know, a lot of students probably would have enrolled in, in some of these courses and not finished them, and then we would have sort of thought, okay, now what are we going to do? Um, but so I think you raise a really good point. I think uh, I don't think it got far enough for us to know the answer, but there was just a spot bill in the beginning. I remember I wrote about this briefly when it was just being talked about. Um, it got a lot of attention, but they never really outlined the bill text. The spot bill didn't say how it would create some committee that would then prove which courses, like you say, which MOOCs and which outside providers would then be, would, would be allowed to, in cases where an online, an, on, an in-person wasn't available, they could do this. So a lot of ifs, and if there were a lot of like details that never got, but it does raise a great question, and David, I'd love to know your answer too, because that was a, it was a strange kind of intent to work around to the typical accreditation. It's creating this kind of committee that would do something very unusual from what I understood. Well, you know, the institutions of higher education can always uh, contract out to third-party providers up to a board of a program. Mm -hmm. Even if that entity that they're contracting out to is not accredited. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have caused some significant change uh, without, without question um, it, because it's California, right? It, 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 it's California. California drives lots of behavior in Washington. Um, but, but it would not have fundamentally required a change in the way the department approached it, you, just as long as no program relied on outside vendors for more than that, except to the extent they're accredited. I mean, you can, you can contract out for, for more than a quarter if the entity you're contracting out to is accredited. So you could have seen, and I think you would have seen, and I think this is probably the most significant change, some of the, the big providers of content in, 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 the, in MOOCs going out and, and trying to get accredited in order for them to be able to offer half of the program. And, and, and I think that really undermined, to some large extent, the, 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 the push towards MOOCs and monetizing MOOCs. Um, and, 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 and I don't think that was bad, a bad outcome. I think that for the reasons that, that uh, Shanna and, and Jeff have, have articulated, um, you know, it, there's reason to be cautious. Because I guess I, in my comment, I, I made, was very clear that I'm, I want to create cultures of success, not failure. So if what we're doing is putting students in, in MOOCs where they fail, and they don't then, because they failed in the MOOC, don't pursue additional education. I think that's really bad. I think it's really, really bad. Other questions? Um, just kind of piggyback on Lance. Could you, could you? Oh, I'm sorry. Dwayne Schaefer, Lumley City College. 
um, CTA Community College Association Secretary. And Shannon really brought a good point when you talked about the divide. Um, the, I think another piece that I think is missing from all of this lovely access is what we're looking at, is that the, the purpose that students go to school. I mean, some have a clear goal of what they wish to do, but a great deal, particularly come to community college because access if you walk that you go, come on in. Um, they don't have a goal. They're, they're pushed or forced because of, you know, parental involvement. And so, yeah, get off the couch, get a job, go to school. School sounds like a good thing, I can go there. So, <laughs> I can get some financial aid. So, um, it, it's, it's, it's all of that, and I, you know, I think we don't have things in place. I mean, California, with student success, talking about the bill, 1456, is putting that, because after 15 years, they have to declare a goal or their registration priority goes to the bottom, and they can't get classes. And most students usually when they come in on the first day of school, which is no longer the case, they would get into classes that were really those hard classes to get into, like anatomy and physiology, in an effort to get 12 units so they can get the full check. And, and you know, you ask them, I'm a counselor, so I'm saying, well, why are you in anatomy? Well, it was open. Oh, okay, well, that's a good reason. So, um, but they had no concept of going into the sciences or anything of that nature, so I think there's a real piece missing of you know, what is one purpose there? I mean, we do a lot of career work and career have assessments and so on and so forth. I mean, we're quick to talk about the math and English, but I think it's really important we have to talk about why are you here? What are we going to do for you? You know, um, four-year schools have entrance requirements, so they have to meet all that. Um, but the other thing, though, going back to what you're talking about accreditation, uh, you know, ACCJC, you probably heard for them in California, have been hitting us with SLOs. Yes. Student learning outcomes, and then of course after student learning outcomes came ASLOs, assessment of student learning outcomes. So you know you have this kind of cycle going through to determine whether or not the student has learned what they're supposed to learn in the class and be able to apply it or whatever. And I kept thinking, well, isn't that a grade? Isn't that what the grade is all about? You know, you got to take the test and so on and so forth. And I know some students, you know, certain classes, you know, they just do it because it needs to be done because it's a general ed course or something. I don't care about the content. I mean, I need a grade, you know, kind of thing. So you have all of that happening. As you're trying to figure out, did Johnny learn what Johnny's supposed to learn out of the right. class? So anyway, that was a statement, I guess, not a question. <laughs> I would give this to you. I actually, think it, I actually think it was a great question to end up because uh, when, when we think about what it is our higher education system is about, we all about what are the students there to learn? And, and this, it, is, it is, so it's a fundamental core question, um, you know, when, when as a federal policy official, I worry a great deal about this, how do we help our students figure out what they want to do when they grow up? Um, I, don't, I don't know as a parent that I've been particularly effective with my daughter. She's going to have an amazing degree, but what's she going to do with it? And, 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 and so even then, it's a, it's a very difficult question. And, and, and the work that community colleges do trying to help students navigate that without parental Understanding is, is really critical, and 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 I do think MOOCs complicate the matter from that perspective. So I, I would t I totally agree with all of your comments, and one of the things that that we're doing and working with colleges uh, about is trying to find that balance between guidance and structure for the student and exploration, so they can, they they can sort of explore and try to figure out what they want to do. Um, and uh, we have a book coming out next year that, that talks a, a lot about these issues and talks about how it relates to sort of the unbundled model of education versus what you might call a more coherent or more cohesive or structured model of education. Um, if, if you want to set up structures that help students explore and sort of have a default exploration curriculum so they're not taking anatomy and physiology um, in their first semester, which is a course that it's incredibly high failure rate. Students find it very, very challenging. Even those who are sort of high, you know, uh, nursing students um, who, who have strong preparation. Um, it, it seems to me that it would be very difficult to create those kinds of structures that guide students through if you have this sort of unbundled model in a large sense where students are sort of picking and choosing courses from different providers and putting them together into some kind of credential. Um, I'm not sure how it would be possible to do that. But. Well, Gerald Thay, Michigan, Oakland Community College. Uh, one of the things that no one's been discussing 
is perhaps some of the improvement in teaching that might occur by faculty being utilized or utilizing MOOCs to upgrade their courses. I mean, what's the biggest problem with community colleges? Many of the teachers who may be fine teachers, et cetera, are 10, 15, 20 years away from their area. They're not doing research. There's no way of any of us in the country knowing whether or not they're improving, whether or not their courses are up to date. It's all very well and good to say, let's take these people in who aren't fully prepared. But we may end up with a whole lot of faculty who are producing materials that aren't really fully prepared. And I just think somebody's got to be thinking about that. Yeah, the, the last day and a half I've spent talking about faculty, particularly faculty that work with adult learners, and to, to, to directly to your point that um, we have faculty who are away from the, you know their their own study and, and potentially disconnected from what employers are looking for, and so they're they're not making sure that they're they what they're teaching and, and what their students are learning and are aligned to what employers are looking for in those disciplines too. And so, how do you improve that? Particularly when there's no cre no credentialing of its, of teachers at the post secondary level like there is in K twelve. One of our, our panelists, Nick, has a train, so we have to make sure that he gets okay, on his me. way. Gets on his no, way to no, the no, train no, no, and to and remain on time for the session. Nick, right, thank you. Jeff, thank you. MOOCs, the impact of massive open online courses on the future of pedagogy, was moderated by David Bergeron, Vice President of Post-Secondary Education at the Center for American Progress with Shanna Smith-Jaggers, Assistant Director, Community College Research Center at Columbia University, Attorney Nicholas Anastasopoulos, with Merrick O'Connell in Worcester, Massachusetts, and Jeffrey R. Young, Technology Editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education. The National Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining and the Professions thanks the panelists and the Hunter College Institutional Computing and Information Technology Department for making this webcast possible. For more information, please visit www.hunter.cuny.edu/ncscbhep.